Hi everybody. Uh, I thought we'd do the uh, the last um, the last set of of uh, slides that we didn't get to yesterday, and uh, this is in relationship to the aerobic exercise. As I said, um, have a brief watch of these because there will be a couple of questions in regards to this. The uh, the one thing that is not considered, you know, when we think of massage therapy quite often is aerobic exercise in terms of the role that it plays. So. You know, quite often therapists think about stretching, mostly a bit of strengthening, maybe some other work, but they don't think of aerobic. So quite often this form of training is not considered by the massage therapist and functional movements more often than not require a level of physical fitness, which kind of is really cardiovascular endurance. So anytime we do anything, whatever that may be in the context of movement and work and what we do, we are in fact actually challenging to some degree the cardiovascular system in order to perform tasks. Some things we need to think about or terms we need to think about with aerobic training is the first that defining physical activity. And physical activity is any bodily movement produced by the contraction of skeletal muscles that result in a substantial increase over resting energy expenditure. Now resting energy expense, uh, expenditure is known as the basal metabolic rate and that's defined as the amount of metabolism it requires for you to lie on a couch and do absolutely nothing. So if that's what's considered base metabolic rate, just lying on the couch, then it, it goes without saying that anything that you do is going to be considered physical activity. The other term we need to think about is physical fitness. And this is described as the ability to perform work. And to perform work, you need cardiorespiratory function, muscle strength and endurance, and musculoskeletal flexibility. In other words, to, form, to perform any kind of task that's required of you at home or at work or your sport, you require cardiorespiratory function, you require strength, endurance, and of course, flexibility in order to move limbs through ranges and so forth. To become physically fit, one must regularly perform physical activity that uses large muscle groups and challenges the cardiorespiratory system. The unfortunate thing is a lot of people think of um, becoming physically fit equals like you know blood sweat and tears in the gym and it doesn't have to when we think about you know the basal metabolic rate as being on the couch and then activity above that is is uh, sort of a requirement for you know strength endurance cardiovascular system and so forth then physically fit can represent anything that includes physical activity, walking and above. So when you think about being physically fit, the other way I want you to define it is that physically fit to perform a task. And as I sort of alluded to yesterday about, you know, <clears throat> lifting a box 30 pounds above the head or waist to chest or floor to waist or whatever it is, that you need to be fit in order to do that. We can look at physical fitness as a continuum from poor to superior. In other words, we can measure it and we can say how fit someone is. And uh, that, that gets done by other individuals that do certain testing, especially trainers and those who come like from a health and fitness promotion kind of program. They learn how to measure sort of that continuum of where someone is in poor to superior. So when I allude to that sort of measuring, there's, there's three key, there's a couple of key areas we need to think about. To perform efficiently using the cardiovascular system, we are in fact actually using oxygen. So we're providing oxygen to tissues and their metabolic needs via the cardiovascular system. So of course we have to intake oxygen to the lungs, uh, that oxygen that enters into the hemoglobin of the blood and it travels around and it does it. So the question becomes, you know, how, how efficient is each individual's ability to utilize the oxygen that's entering into their body via the lungs and then through this cardiovascular system. It is measured through maximum oxygen consumption and this is known as VO2 maximum. We're not going to get into VO2 max, but we're going to talk to some degree about the fact that the VO2 max is the measure of the body's ability to use oxygen. So we can measure its ability to use oxygen. And of course, it is measured on a, on a numeric scale. The higher the number, the more efficiency 
efficient you use oxygen. So we can look at it as the maximum amount of oxygen consumed per minute when the individual has reached maximum effort. And we can measure the amount that, of oxygen that they use. And of course, the higher the number, the more in shape someone is said to be. And the lower the number, the more out of shape someone is said to be. And uh, this is, again, something that's done outside our sort of our scope. But it can be measured to get a sense of where someone's at. The other key term is endurance. And endurance is the measure of fitness. And endurance kind of represents the ability to work for extended periods of time without fatigue. So, of course, the one thing that fatigue can lead to is injury. And when we talked about lifting the boxes yesterday in regards to, you know, I lift 30 and I need to train the patient above 30 in order to avoid injury, the, th the same thing happens with endurance. If someone's VO2 max only represents a low number and, you know, you sort of look it up uh, in terms of a job or a task that someone's doing, and that VO2 max of that job is higher than where the patient's at in their VO2 max, the same idea, there have the, they have a greater potential for injury. So the example I always use is, you know, somebody has, um, has a heart attack or they're elderly and they want to be able to cut the lawn. If their VO2 max is, say, at 30 and to cut a lawn is, is 28 or 29, then the perception of the individual who's cutting the lawn, their perception will be that cutting the lawn is extremely difficult and there's a potential for injury. If cutting the lawn is at 28 or 29 and their VO2 max is at 50 or 55, then of course you can perceive and understand that the perception of work done by the individual, well, they will perceive that the cutting of the lawn is far easier and also the potential of injury goes down. So it's something you need to consider as well when you're, you're sort of having that conversation around the functional requirements for your client when you're creating a treatment plan. The next term is aerobic exercise training, which is, of course, the augmentation of the energy utilization of the muscle by the means of an exercise program. So, you know, if someone needs a higher VO2 max or they need to have better endurance, then, of course, we're going to augment that by having them do training and therefore challenging the cardiovascular system to get more efficient. So exercise, aerobic exercise training is the improvement of the muscle's ability to use energy as a direct result of increased levels of oxidative enzymes in the muscles, increased mitochondrial density and size, and an increased muscle fiber capillary supply. So when we aerobically train someone, we can expect to see a change in oxidative enzymes. And if you remember from your, your Krebs cycle lectures, you know, this is where these oxidative enzymes come in and we, we, we are able to make more of them and use them better. We find there's increase in mitochondrial density and more mitochondria are created. And then of course, an increase in muscle fiber capillary supply. In other words, the body actually starts to create more vessels to supply the, the muscles who are demanding more oxygen in order to function. Adaptation is for, you know, whether we're looking at stretching adaptation or strengthening adaptation, if we think of Wolf's Law, the same thing applies to aerobic training. We need adaptation. In other words, we need to challenge the system in order for it to adapt, which makes it get better. So adaptation is the cardiovascular system and the muscles trained they trained to adapt to the training stimulus. So the cardiovascular system and the muscle system trained adapt to the training stimulus over time. And changes can be measured in as little as 10 to 12 weeks. And as we know, in thinking about adaptation and adapting with what we talked about yesterday, this would result in these key things happening, more mitochondria density, more uh, blood running to the area and so forth. Myocardial oxygen consumption. This is the measure of the oxygen used by the myocardium. In a healthy individual, a balance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand is maintained during even maximum exercise. I don't know what you took in your physiology for the heart, but we need to understand that the heart use, barely uses anything anaerobically to function. The myocardium requires oxygen. So heart physiology and metabolism is 
is um, aerobic. It's not anaerobic. So when we are working out, we need to supply the heart oxygen in order for it to function properly. So we say then the myocardial muscle extracts 70 to 75% of the oxygen from the blood during rest. So of course then it starts to go up as the demand increases. Of course when we exercise aerobically, our heart rate goes up, therefore its oxygen demand goes up, and therefore we need good efficient intake of oxygen to meet the demand of the heart and then the rest of course to what's happening at the muscle level in order to perform even when we're going out say for a run for example we can decondition the system the same as we saw in strengthening so prolonged bread rest will have maximum vo2 max diminish so prolonged bed rest will find decreases in maximum oxygen consumption cardiac output and muscular strength and this occurs very rapidly so a lot of work is required in order to increase your VO2 max. And it takes very little to have all of that diminish. Just the fact of no longer performing the tasks, you will see a decrease in this oxygen consumption. So the energy systems. Within this, we have to think of phosphagen or the ATP PC system. So of course, this is the utilization of phosphocreatine and ATP and these are stored in the muscle cells as we know. This phosphocreatine, of course, is a fuel source when we don't have oxygen. So when we start exercising aerobically, the first 30 seconds of exercise, the muscles are actually using phosphagen before they start to utilize the ATP. So we go from the phosphagen system to the anaerobic ATP system, and then we enter into the aerobic system, which you talked about with the Krebs cycle. Remembering, of course, that ATP is required, right, to do these things. Anaerobic glycolytic system, glycogen is the fuel source. So we, again, we've gone from the phosphagen, now we're going into the anaerobic system. So glycogen is a fuel source. There's still no oxygen required. And the glycogen is the fuel source to create ATP. So we say ATP is resynthesized in the cell. When we think about the aerobic system, something happened to lactic acid in the presence of oxygen. But something happens, something happens again when there's no oxygen, and that is this anaerobic glycolytic system produces lactic acid, and that lactic acid hangs around and then gets taken out of the muscle off to the liver to be reconstituted. So the anaerobic glycolytic system is the major source of energy from the 30th to the 90th second of exercise. So we initially started with the phosphagen system, which is about the first 30 seconds. Then we move into the uh, glycolytic system where we're actually using glycogen. I always like to think of glycogen as a stored muscle sugar. And we're, we're recreating ATP, but we have to remember the anaerobic system produces a very small amount of ATP. And the byproduct of that anaerobic system is lactic acid, which then, of course, does a couple things. If it hangs around too long, it starts to change the pH environment of the muscle and it doesn't function properly. But the majority of the time, lactic acid is, is shipped out of the muscle and heads over to the, the liver where it's, where it's changed. Then from the anaerobic system, we move into the aerobic system. And the aerobic sy the system utilizes glycogen, fats, and proteins as fuel sources. And these are used relative to their availability. So, of course, glycogen will move into the aerobic system for a short period of time. And as we move further into the aerobic system, the body then will start looking towards the fats or lipids in the body to convert into fuel sources for aerobic system to be able to perform tasks. So glycogen, fats, and proteins are fuel sources and are used relative to their availability and the intensity of the exercise. Oxygen is required to create ATP. And the oxygen, as you know from the Krebs cycle, is resynthesized in the mitochondria. And in the presence of oxygen, of course, it goes through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain to create the energy to reproduce ADP into ATP. And this goes on and on and on as long as we keep going. Right? This system predominates over the other energy systems after the second minute of exercise. And as a general rule, unless things have changed, you really get into full aerobic metabolism at about the 12 to 15 minute mark when you start to utilize fats to create ATP. So the sad thing is, you know, a McDonald's hamburger is going to 
be converted to lipids and stored in your body within a very short period of time. And yet when you're out for a run, you won't even start to use those fat stores for anywhere between you know 10 to 15 minutes. Um, this kind of seems unfair, doesn't it? The recruitment of motor units, of course, we've already talked about when we looked at muscle physiology. So the rate of work will depend on the, the number and the recruitment of motor units. The different fibers, of course, are recruited selectively during exercise, and that's something that the you know sort of is, is done through the nervous system, and you're not even aware of it. The physiological response to aerobic exercise, of course, the body makes adjustments to meet the increased need for oxygen and nutrients and to remove metabolic waste products. So we can see that there is a cardiovascular response and we can see that there is a respiratory response. So of course, cardiovascular response would be harder contractions of the heart and faster beats of the heart. The respiratory response would be deeper, faster respiration. Now, most of you might think initially that the reason we breathe deeper and faster is to get more oxygen into the system. That is not what happens. Carbon dioxide is actually acidic in nature. And if we allow carbon dioxide to build up in the body, we end up in a state of what's called acidosis. And, and acidosis can lead to death. It's actually a significant, um, a significant influence on the physiology of the body. Now, I don't know if you took pH scale in, in A&P, but the pH scale, of course, represents you know, so a, 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 an acidic to an alkaline environment through the scale. If we're not able to blow off CO2, we move into a more acidic environment and the body won't function well. And eventually if, if the pH gets too acidic, we can get to an environment where the heart will stop and the individual will die. So the reason we see a deeper and a faster uh, change in the respiratory response is to actually blow off CO2 not to intake more oxygen. So as the higher levels of CO2 come up because we're aerobically working, that is measured in the brain and the brain then sends a response to the respiratory system to speed up and breathe deeper. So how do we determine an exercise program? Well, the first is frequency. And there's no clear cut answer on what is the most effective frequency of exercise for adaptation. But if we think about going back to the strength training that we talked about yesterday, it can vary dependent on the health and the age of the patient. What is somewhat considered to be optimum is three to four times a week. So doing some aerobic activity for 20 minutes to 30 minutes, three to four times a week. Lower intensity, uh, greater frequency can be beneficial. So if we lower the intensity, maybe we can do five or six times a week. When we look at that idea of three to four times a week, if we drop it down to two, you don't generally tend to see a training response of more efficient use of oxygen and so forth. So three to four times a week is kind of what you're after. Intensity, well, guess what? The overload principle actually exists for the cardiovascular training as well. As you know, we, if you remember, we saw this in, in the resistance training portion. Well, the overload principle takes place in the aerobic training world as well. So overload principle is a load greater than regular that not regularly encountered in everyday life. And to stimulate this training response, we must provide an overload to the system. We have to make it work harder than it used to to get that adaptation. A conditioning response usually occurs at between 60 and 90% of maximum heart rate. 70% is a minimum level stimulus for eliciting a conditioning response in healthy young individuals. There's exercise does not need to be exhaustive to achieve a training response, but we do want to get to that point where we are challenging the system. So when we look at maximum heart rate training, which is something that we think about when we do train, we, we have to understand that the maximum heart rate a human male can achieve and still maintain good cardiac output is about 220 beats per minute. Above 220 beats per minute, the heart's ability to eject blood out of the heart and into the system really starts to diminish. And when we have uh, tachycardic pathologies and some people get into heart rates of 300 plus, these individuals get lightheaded and pass out because the heart is beating so fast it can't actually eject enough blood out into the system. So we know that the maximum with 
still maintaining efficient cardiac output is around 220 beats per minute. For females, it's approximately 206. Um, so what we do is we, use, we take the maximum heart rate of 220 and then use the rule of percentage of maximum heart rate, which is about 88%. So the reason for the unusual numbers was to represent heart rate. And, and you can take what's called a Borg scale as well and multiply it by 10 to compare maximum heart rate training. Now, when we take that 70% that, um, that we see here, what we would do is we would take the 220 beats per minute and we would train at the higher end at 70% of 220 or 206 if it's a female. And the higher up you go, of course, the higher intensity it is. So 80% of maximum heart rate is considered very high intensity aerobic exercise. 60% of maximum heart rate is considered the lower end of training. We don't want to get below 60%. 70% is the optimum. So if you take the, you take 220 beats per minute, you minus the age of your patient. So in my case, I'm say 60. So that means we would take 220. We would minus my age six to, to 160. And then we would calculate 70% of that 160. And then we would have the patient perform their aerobic exercise maintaining a heart rate that would be 70% of 160 to get a good training effect. Females, of course, would be 206 minus 60, which would be 146. And then, of course, it would be 70% of 146 that you would be training at. The other way we can look at is something called the perceived, the Borg scale of perceived exertion. This is instead of taking the time to you know check your pulse and do the calculation, that kind of stuff, this is actually a scale that works on perception. So we ask um, um, a patient or client to perform exercise, show them the scale and say, where do you think you are in the scale? So this scale measures the patient's perception of the level of their exertion during exercise. This helps the patient kind of have a more cognitive understanding of what intensity they're working at. The old scale used to go from 6 to 20. And what, the reason it went, because it seems kind of weird, 6 to 20, the reason for the unusual numbers was to represent the heart rate. So you would take, say, if I said I'm a, I'm a, I'm a 10 out of 20, I would multiply it by 10 to get an idea that's probably I'm at, a, I'm at 100 beats per minute. And it kind of didn't correlate well. So now this newer scale goes from 0 to 10. So you would have the patient perform a task, maybe a walk on the treadmill or run on the treadmill. You would ask them, you know, where they are in that scale of one to 10. And because again, we're thinking of, you know, that 60 to 70% kind of training, if they got above and started saying I'm an eight or nine out of 10, we would likely back off the intensity to keep them kind of at a seven. Specificity principle, again, you know, we talked about this in, car, in, in strength training. It also makes sense in uh, cardiovascular training, aerobic training. This is, the, uh, this is the adaptations of metabolic and physiological systems as a result of the demands of posed. So we have to think about, you know, again, what does the patient have to do functionally, whether that be their sport, their job, or their day-to-day -day life? We have to remember that muscle strength without a significant increase in total oxygen consumption is something to think about. Aerobic or endurance training without training the anaerobic systems, or maybe anaerobic training without training the aerobic systems, or maybe aerobic training to the specific type of activity. So again, we have to be specific in the prescription that we create to meet the requirements or the needs of the patient. <clears throat> there is a reversibility principle, again, which we kind of talked about with the dropping of VO2 max with lack of movement. The benefits of exercise training are transient and reversible. So we create a prescription for our patient. If they don't do it, then, you know, if they do it for a while and things get better, if they stop doing it, they're going to reverse all the work that they've done. Okay, this is the last set of slides for the semester. So there's not too many here, but uh, this will be part two in terms of aerobic exercise. And this is about the creation of an exercise program. When we create an aerobic exercise program, 
Much like we saw in, in strength training, we need a warm up period. So there is a period of time between the onset activity and the bodily adjustments needed to meet the physical demands of the exercise. So this warm up period should be 10 minutes. Um, and that can be just a much lower level of aerobic activity. So for example, say you're doing a light jog on a treadmill, you might have them do a 10 minute uh, walk on the treadmill before they do their aerobic training. The warm up stimulates the various systems to get ready for the activity. So we're gonna increase muscle temperature, which is good, which makes the fascia and the, and the connective tissue much more pliable. We're gonna start opening up those systems of the phosphagen and the uh, anaerobic and aerobic systems. So we're gonna increase need for oxygen to meet the energy demands. We're going to activate or get the muscles being active. We're going to stimulate the nervous system to get ready for adaptation for it. And also when the cardiovascular system, the warm up period also increases venous return to the heart. So what the warm up period does is literally prepare the cardiovascular system to get ready for the aerobic activity that it's going to do. We never want to jump somebody hard into aerobic activity because they're going to be, they're going, their perception will be it's far too difficult. So the warm up period again prevents or um, stimulates the system to prepare for the exercise. After we've done the warm up, <coughs> we have the aerobic exercise period. And of course, this is the conditioning part of the exercise program. We have to think about the frequency, how often they would do this. We have to think how intense this exercise would be. Again, maybe you're thinking of that, you know, maximum heart rate minus the age and then 70% of that. Or you might be using a Borg scale to do that. The time and type all influence this. So is it a, is it aerobic bicycle ride? Is it a, a walk in the treadmill? Is it an elliptical, right? There's a number of different things that you can think of that would still challenge the aerobic system to call exercise training. Aerobic exercises traditionally target the large muscle groups. So of course we're talking about the glutes and the quads, the hamstrings and so forth. And this is how what the muscles we usually challenge to challenge the aerobic system. If you were to have someone say, for example, who was paralyzed from the waist down, there are arm training machines that you can aerobically train. But because you're using the upper body and smaller muscle groups, there has to be significant alterations in the prescription because you're using smaller group muscle groups to work. So the intensity has to go down because you're using smaller muscle groups. There are four traditional methods. There is continuous training. There is interval training. So continuous training is, you know, just going out for that nice long run. Interval training is sort of doing intervals of work and rest periods. Sometimes this is known as speed work. There's also circuit training. So you might have be doing other exercises that still stimulate the cardiovascular system. So it could be running and then moving to very quickly moving to push-ups, going back to a run again, and then going back to um, um, sort of push-ups again. And that would be a combination of circuit and interval training. Circuit training would have you go from a run to push-ups, to sit-ups, to chin-ups, whatever it might be. Of course, once you do that, then we have a cool down period, which is similar to the warm up. We want to slow these systems get down to get back to almost a resting state. So it is similar to the warm up period. It should last 10 to 15 minutes and it should be total body movements. Now, the reason we do a cool down period is a couple of reasons. One is blood pooling. The cardiovascular system, we've had all kinds of uh, vasodilation that's incurred to move blood around, to get to the specific muscles that are, 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 have been challenged and you know their demand for increased blood. And if we stop very suddenly and we don't cool down, then say for example in the legs, we have all these big blood vessels that have all dilated to, to, to help uh, supply the, the quads and glutes and so forth. Well, because we have all this blood pooling or curling, then all of a sudden we start to see blood pressure drop and the patient can faint. So we want to think about that. The other part is cool down period enhances the recovery period with oxidation of metabolic waste products. The way that it was put to me many years ago was when you're exercising, you are taking from the bank, right? So your body during rest deposits energy into the bank. When you're aerobically working out, you are of course taking from the bank. The cool down period provides an opportunity to deposit energy back into the bank in an appropriate way. 
It also helps prevent myocardial ischemia, arrhythmias, and other cardiovascular complications. So remember, the heart requires oxygen to function properly. If we don't cool down and we immediately stop, it causes some differences in, in myocardial physiology, and it can lead to weird heartbeats that can happen or possible lack of oxygen to the heart. And if there's some compromise to that heart, could actually lead to a heart attack. What kind of physiological changes can you expect from an aerobic exercise program, right? Well, you can think of a number of things, right? Your in increased efficiency of oxygen, um, your uh, increase of endurance if, if you're uh, you know, requiring a higher endurance to perform and so forth. Applications of aerobic training for the deconditioned individual and the patient with chronic illness. So again, we, you know, sometimes we get people who've got some issues here and this could result in them being deconditioned. So the fact that, you know, they've got some kind of musculoskeletal problem, they've had pain, discomfort, they can't function properly, and it results in them not performing tasks. So they become deconditioned. So we have to think about that. So this can be the result of any disease or illness that results in an activity. They have a decreased work capacity. In other words, they have a decreased cardiac output. So their heart's not working as efficiently as it should. They get decreased circulating blood, which can result in tachycardia, orthostatic hypotension, dizziness, and periods of syncope. So we have to think about the deconditioned patient when we're providing, you know, sort of aerobic training to them. Well, there's a decrease in plasma and red blood cells. So they don't even have as efficient a system to actually carry oxygen throughout, throughout the body. They have a decrease in lean body mass and they have increased excretion of urinary calcium. Remember, calcium is all about muscle contractions and muscle contractions do occur during endurance training. So we have to think about the deconditioned patient when we're providing an aerobic prescription. Through an exercise program, the results of deconditioning can be reversed, and that's anybody at any time in any age. Even in the disease state, we can reverse deconditioning. It just means if there's a diseased state, we have to be more cognizant um, of what we need to do safely for them to recondition. Again, we may not be asking a sick individual to make it to the Olympics, but we are certainly are saying, you know, that you need to start reconditioning in order to perform normal functions in life. Uh, thanks, everybody. That's all there is to it. Uh, um, thank you for having a read of these. And uh, as I said, uh, it was great looking after you guys this semester. And we'll see you at OPs and expect an email in regards to the final. Thanks.